Electricast. Cars say a lot about who we are. It represents freedom for a lot of people. This season on Drive, I'm going to talk to all sorts of different people. I looked at car names. Yes. A- and yes. I found all the car names that have science or astronomically it's inspired. It's crazy. It's huge. It is. Okay, yes, sure. I happen to be CEO of Ford Motor Company. For me, it's all about cars, movement, and our mutual passion for things that get us around. This is Drive, and I'm Jim Farley. This episode is brought to you by Paramount Plus. Ewan McGregor stars as Count Alexander Rostov in A Gentleman in Moscow, the new limited series based on the best selling novel. Stream it on March 29th with the Paramount Plus with Showtime plan. Visit ParamountPlus.com to try it free. Hold on to your butts. We are changing the course of history as we see it. That is what Wesker demands. Now, this affects Iris. Um, Iris, where are you? What you feel only matters to you. I do not entertain hypotheticals. The world as it is is vexing enough. Iris, I have a tip for you. Don't take drugs! Or whatever movies with Wesley and Iris. What up and welcome to Or Whatever Movies. I'm your co-host, Iris, and I'm here with my older brother. Wesley, and today we are discussing David Fincher's first movie since Mank, The Listener. The Listener? The Listener. That's the best you could do? Michael Fassbender, as the killer, says a handful of words, maybe a dozen words in this entire movie. That's not to say he doesn't talk. And then, and what I discovered is that this movie, there are watchers and there are washers. Watchers, you have to watch very carefully or it's going to go by and you're not going to understand exactly what's happening. Washers, you just sit back, let them wash over you and kind of get a feel for what the movie is. This one was a listener. So the main character is a listener because he's actively listening and very vigilant. He's a very vigilant assassin. And you were a listener because you had to listen to him waxing philosophical in order to understand what this movie was actually about? Not just that. David Fincher and crew made this an auditory soundscape. This is a sonic movie. And if you didn't notice, then you missed a major component of the killer, which David Fincher would be very disappointed in. Every little audio clue was in there that we very much went into his head quite literally. He would take one of the earbuds out of his ear and the song playing would be isolated to one side of the sound mix. The ambient itself, the heater ticking off and on, uh, all the little sounds and stuff. It was very important that you pay attention to the soundscape of this movie. And I just didn't. Well, I guess Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross are probably pretty disappointed. This is the, what number collaboration is this for them? Many, and they're relatively new. But like Tim Burton and Danny Elfman, it seems like uh, Atticus Ross and Trent Reznor stick with David Fincher. I mean, not all the time. They also did like Soul for Disney Pixar. (laughs) I did notice the score when the killer is sitting on the park bench eating his McDonald's sandwich protein style. The score is under that entire scene, but it's mixing almost imperceptibly with the ambient noise. And so this is what, maybe 30 minutes into the movie? Because for the first 20 minutes, he's lying on sheetrock in a deconstructed WeWork office space and nothing happens. (laughs) That's when I came up with the alternate title, Yo Giller. Yo Yo Giller. Like, oh, because he's like, he does yoga in there? He's a yogi killer. Oh. (laughs) Come on. It's better than The Listener. Well, because this movie is a listener in our Watcher Washer dichotomy. It has a, a, we're establishing a new, a new uh, style. Gotcha. I was also playing with unsuccessfully Fassbenegger. Uh, Probably not. Unless you have the direct correlation specifically to Arnold Schwarzenegger, you can't really mess with his name. You can't mess with Fassbender? Yeah. Oh, Fassbender. Fast and Fast. See, I don't know, man. You run the risk. I'm leaving it in the podcast. Arnold Michael Fassbender doing his best Arnold Schwarzenegger impression as the Terminator. He's the human Terminator. Except he keeps saying, I'm no genius, that he's nothing special. He's definitely not a Terminator. He pales in comparison to the character he plays in the Alien series, in in Ridley Scott's Alien prequels. So what's your opinion on the casting of Fassbender? Michael Fassbender is great. He's quiet, he's powerful, he's scary. 
He's very lean and wiry and, and has what you seemingly like, like a perfectly disciplined the killer type physique. He, he has an interesting face, but he can hide in a crowd in the Champs-Élysées, which I think he does really well. Michael Fassbender is great. He really is great. And of course, I always think about his cameo as Archie Hickox, is it? In Inglorious Bastards? Yes, where he speaks to queens properly. He is the epitome of chameleonic for me. I assigned a weird facial agnosia to him. You know, this disease that people have or this condition that people have where they can't recognize faces. Yeah, Brad Pitt says he suffers from that and it's really hurt his career in some ways. I bet. I mean, he's in such a public facing career. Uh, I had an instructor at USC who had facial blindness, and it was a real handicap being a showrunner and whatnot. Anyway, I feel like I never recognized him until Inglorious Bastards. And for that reason, he's great for the killer. He blends in. He is nondescript, although his German tourist was a little conspicuous, I thought. <laughs> Just a little overly touristy, but kind of a thankless role for any actor, I think. Well... Notice my full stop in this. Michael Fassbender was great, full stop, because Michael Fassbender was the only thing interesting in The Killer. Maybe Tilda Swinton, maybe Warlock. And by Warlock, you mean Charles Parnell, who's who's now like the new... The new Sam know, Jackson? The new, I was going to say Aquafina, but no. <laughs> He's... <laughs> But Charles Parnell, he just shows up. He's like, I'm in Mission Impossible. I'm in The Killer. I'm going to start working with the greatest directors of all time. Maybe he was always around and we just didn't notice him until his what I felt was his prominent role in Top Gun Maverick. But whatever the case, I waited for something to happen just like he did for six days. And I was like, oh, he's a narrator. He was basically, if uh, Only Murders in the Building were a podcast from The Killer's perspective, he was a podcaster. He was a blogger. He really wanted us to listen to the things that he had to say because he figured he had interesting things to say. In my humble opinion, not so much. But that was the only similarity really to Fight Club because this was more like Weight Club. We're just going to hang out for six days. And my question is, what makes the killer think that we care what he has to say? Were you all locked in and like, this is a consummate professional and he has insight into a world that I will never experience and thus I should listen? I suppose there was something interesting about the assassin's procedural. He was so meticulous about how he did what he did and he had he seemed to have his own moral standards about it as well. But the narration achieved like a wave the gun level, nonsensical kind of rambling. Uh, at once he's talking about birth and death rates, which sent me out. <laughs> on a whole mental tangent where I was like, geez, that's a lot more births than deaths. Right. I think it was like four, four point seven or something to every death. Yeah. Four point seven to every one point eight. I was like, that's very incongruent. And then he's talking about his he has his mantras about not getting distracted and don't improvise, anticipate. And I was like, whoa. And I just don't know if it's a symptom of short attention span or, or it's just like, I don't have time to really think deeply about what the subtext is or how what he's saying connects to his actions. It felt very disconnected and really made me check out. Man, see, you could never be a sitting in an office for four to six days waiting for a dude to appear in the window. You don't have his discipline. But even still, he's spouting all this stuff, and I understand what you're saying. And the disconnect not only for, of you from the movie, but also from his monologue to himself. I mean, I guess if you're by yourself and waiting, your mind wanders and doesn't have to be focused on the room you're in or the window that you're staring at across the way. But his rules were very, remember Zombieland? Where, you know, the rules to stay alive, never go into a, a room with only one door, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. He had those rules and then kind of didn't listen to them. And I'm going to say that the killer, Michael Fassbender, uh, the character kind of deserved to die. He didn't follow his own rules, said them repeatedly for us to follow and then didn't follow them, and is kind of a crappy assassin. Kelly Ray at one point spoke up when he was in the Dominican Republic and said he's not very good at his job. He's not good hmm. at following people. He talks a big game. I also, if I had been the Arliss Howard character, would have sent assassins to kill him because he botched the job and it was unnecessary. He got all caught up in himself and failed his only objective for six days, which was incredibly frustrating to me. 
Catherine Zeta-Jones did it better in traffic 23 years ago. She was like, this could be our only chance to do it. Get out of the car and shoot him in the head. Just shoot him. Sean Connery in The Rock. You must never hesitate. He had that dude dead to rights. And he's waiting for his stupid heartbeat to drop below 65 or something arbitrary and miss the shot as a result. If you have the shot, take the shot. Sounds like you have your own assassin standards, Wes. Oh, my God. Just kill him. That's all you're contracted to do. And he blew it because he waited after having that dude cleanly in the crosshairs for like 60 seconds. Oh, you're making me all upset. (laughs) You're getting all heated. I think this is a good sign. Uh, This is a good sign that there was something engaging about the killer. Kelly Ray said going in and out of the music, like in his head and then out of his head, when we see his perspective, she said it really racks up the tension, right? And I I, kind of stopped for a minute and reassessed what was happening to me in this movie. And I was like, yeah, I guess so. And I thought that the music was making for good tension. Like, oh my God, is he going to do it? Is he going to get away on the little scooter? And then I realized it wasn't. I was just frustrated by how incongruent and and intangible this movie felt to me. I love the little tidy electric scooter car chase (laughs) he's all peeling out in his little electric scooter the biggest point of tension in that whole quote-unquote car chase was him just getting the thing unlocked and uh it was pretty funny he was like (laughs) i couldn't tell if the cops were on to him and they're like he's getting away on a scooter conspicuous german tourist or whatever it was or if There were just cops everywhere, like a a really appropriate Parisian uh, police force response to a call, a distress call. But it seemed like they were everywhere. They were just setting up a perimeter and he was trying his best to get out of it before he was locked in. Yeah. And I guess that was dynamic and, and fun. And we were finally out in the world. All that nonsense for like 30 minutes for a freaking miss for him to botch the job and get up and leave. I guess we're now we're in a serial killer. He was like a migratory Leon. He was not terribly smart, at least practically speaking. And then like had all these rules and like was running around Paris or whatever, trying to get away like that one thing that goes wrong. And he's now stuck with this problem for the rest of the movie. We establish him as the killer, an assassin for hire who's on a big job. He spends 30, 40 minutes missing. And then (laughs) he goes home and he finds out that there was an attempted assassination on his partner. She like ran through a plate glass window in an effort to escape. I don't know that they did anything to her necessarily, did they? It wasn't clear. It certainly seems like there was an attempt on her life or... Which was weird because they blamed him, the lawyer, Charles Parnell's lawyer blamed Fassbender, the killer, for going home. He was like, why did you go home? And he wasn't even home yet. So that was strange. And it was also strange that the killer would live in like this open air, completely unsecured villa in the Dominican Republic. But anyway, (laughs) he goes home. He finds out that there was an attempt on, you know, his own. And so the rest becomes a revenge tale. Yeah, I wonder what, what other movie of, of a killer is like that, do you think? I mean, lots of movies. Oh, right. John Wick, where something happens to him personally. So he goes and digs up all the weapons and then spends the rest of the movie relentlessly pursuing and shooting everyone. Yeah, that was like six movies ago. This So Tilda Swinton, ultimately, I guess she was, what, what was she called? She wasn't the brute. She was the expert. One of the yep. two assassins. That is a perfect microcosm for this movie where they talk endlessly and you're like, oh, maybe the talking has something to do with it. Maybe she'll be able, one killer will be able to convince another killer who's heard everything in the book why they should be allowed. To, oh, no, she's dead. He shot her in the head. And so the, the whole thrust of this movie is an average of, I don't know, one kill per chapter, maybe one kill for every 30 minutes of dialogue and nothing else happening. Which felt a little Fincher light. This didn't have, this had its fair share of violence. Why did it feel Fincher light to me? Well, it wasn't gratuitous or graphic, and he's known for hard subjects. Maybe this is the more settled, uh, more aged Mank style Fincher. Well, I think the way that Fincher attempted to differentiate this from the John Wick series is, you know, this is obviously something more cerebral, or at least that's what they're attempting. One thing that was that could have been interesting if it was really played out was this seemingly mounting parent sense of paranoia that the killer had. I'm not sure. Maybe he was always paranoid. But once he's back in the real world and he's on his 
revenge tour. He's looking at the dude with the striped socks in the airport. He's taking different planes because of him. He's very aware of his surroundings, the possibility that he might be being followed. That could have been interesting, maybe if it played more into his narration, his, his voiceover. And maybe it did, but you said earlier that the killer was a character who maybe should have died. And I think that if the paranoia kind of played out and if he died from his own paranoia, like a self-fulfilling prophecy, maybe that would have been interesting. But instead, he's like happy on the beach with his loved one, serving her espresso with lemon, which is very delicious, by the way. <laughs> and thoroughly boring and generic. Right. It seemed like a not, not unfitting kind of generic ending. And I wasn't happy for him. Yeah. I mean, I wasn't unhappy for him. Like, I'm, I guess I'm happy that he's alive and, and whatever. Maybe I just, it felt incomplete because, like, this guy is, he's destined to get his own. When Tilda Swinton's on her way out, she's like, I'm going to haunt you and you'll think about me when you get your own, when you get your comeuppance. That's yeah. just the way the world of assassins works. Look, I will allow that David Fincher is maybe a master storyteller. He is a great director. Maybe some questionable choices for his material and his output as of late, in my humble opinion. But the dude is he's smart, he's meticulous, he's very purposeful, and he also says he's seen this movie some, or somewhere around 400 times in the various edits and things like that, so he has no interest to, in revisiting the killer as a concept or for sequels, because they're apparently it's based on a graphic novel, and there are many of them, many stories. He took what he wants, and now he is done. Which is to say that the killer never gets of his comeuppance. So we're stuck with him on a beach, living a mundane existence, just like his mundane career, ineffectual career. You know why he's not called the, this movie's not called The Assassin? Because he never assassinates anybody. He kills people out of revenge because he sucks as a hired killer. Hmm. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price. Priceline. Life is hard, but finding a really great podcast makes the days go by so much easier. Hi, my name is Blue Tulusma. I'm a writer, an emotional intelligence coach, and the host of Humanize with Blue Tulusma, a podcast where we believe that when you humanize everyone in the room, a great conversation is almost guaranteed. Join us every week here on Electricast as me and my guest co-hosts unpack big topics and interview even bigger personalities with a sense of humor and a dash of mischief. If you're looking for a new best friend in your head, we've got you covered. Electricast. Not exactly a sympathetic killer character lead. But going back to your earlier point, I also noticed obviously the striped socks and everything he did and, and you're constantly looking around and you're joining in in his paranoia. And so I was agitated a lot of the time by the environment. Like you said, the open layout and concept of the house where he should have been fortified and, and protected. Not so much to the killers or dinosaurs could have come at him from any angle in that house in the Dominican Republic. Definitely. Yeah, I was. I mean, I love the indoor outdoor concept flow concepting. But boy, it doesn't seem like a very secure place for a killer. And maybe he could have had high tech motion sensors and and, uh, and electronic fences and stuff and geofencing or whatever. But he wasn't that technically proficient. Uh, I was shocked that he knew how to use his smartphone to unlock the scooter. I was shocked that he knew how to use his Fitbit or his heart monitor, heart rate monitor or whatever, because otherwise he was listening to like a, an old timey iPod. Was that? <laughs> That's true. That Fitbit. I find those things to be really, really uh, stressful. Like with I, that alarm going off every 30 minutes or whatever. He was slave to his routine that ultimately was ineffective. So you were talking about him waxing philosophical and also you didn't call it high concept. What did you call it? A yogi killer. Not that he was enlightened because he wasn't really. And as, much, as purposeful as the filmmaking was, I was curious what kind of statement you felt they were making with everything else. He was eating nothing but junk food. He had one banana and otherwise he was like in Starbucks and stuff. And, and so it was all the Smiths, but I doubt Morrissey would have approved of his diet. <laughs> and 
they were saying something, I think, about global consumerism and Starbucks, McDonald's, Amazon. Are you talking about the deeper meaning here? Consumption? But I don't know what it was or if it mattered. Cheap food and fast fashion. I mean, I do know this answer in a respect. I'm not sure that it was communicated properly because the genesis of these ideas of McDonald's and WeWork and Amazon, they all came as byproducts of trying to solve different problems. And it was reactionary. They talked about wanting to, you know, him going to McDonald's for his fix of 10 grams of protein, but they were going to shoot at the McDonald's at the Champs-Élysées in Paris and they couldn't do it. They wouldn't, there was no way they were, were going to let him shoot at a McDonald's like that. And then they found one not far from there that just delivered stuff through a window. No faces, no interaction. You can order on your phone. They hand you a sack of meat. And then Amazon, they had three pages or something of how he was going to copy that dude's key card. And they were like, isn't there like an easier way? And the writer who wrote Seven, by the way, um, was like, David, if there was an easier way, like everybody would do it. And he's like, just check it out. And like 11 seconds later, after checking on Amazon, he's like, dude, there are totally like key card copiers on Amazon. And so they put that in the movie where it's delivered to an Amazon locker where he doesn't have to go and interact with someone at a store. And then he just uses that. It said something about him being efficient and staying away from people and not being recognized or to be on as few like, you know, public cameras as possible. But I'm not sure that that was communicated effectively. I think it sent a different message like, oh, this is modern and I guess hip and cool. If you can count McDonald's hip and cool. And just contemporary, you know? I have a theory about this, but first, those key card replicators are pretty freaky. Do you know that there's also apps that magicians use to unlock your iPhone? Like real magicians as part of an act? Or like digital manipulator thief magicians? I think anybody can find and use these, but a, ma- a magician used one on me and my iPhone. He took my phone. And he was like, go, you know, pretending like he was going through it. And he was like, look, I'm taking a picture. And the audience is like, haha, because the majority of people know that there are some apps that you can access without actually opening the phone. But then he was like going through my apps and he looked at my Tesla app and he was like, I'm going to summon your car. And I was like, what? And then he showed me my phone and he had unlocked it. And I like tried to see, I like double checked and tested if he could use face recognition from far away. He can't. I was like so freaked out about this. And people came up to me after the act and they were like, were you part of this? Did you, did he know your password? I was like, no. So Brian and I looked it up and there are random number generation things that you can connect to the phone and unlock your phone. And it's freaky. It's freaky deaky stuff. And you think you're secure, but it's really just... An illusion. I think that the killer was trying to show the dark side of enlightened, the concept of enlightened emptiness. You know how like <laughs> Buddhism is all about empty yourself in the emptiness and the void, like there's no desire and desire is the essence of all pain. Hey, my religion is not your Netflix movie. I'm just saying that you're asking what this is about, (laughs) and I think that it's probably not a big leap, considering he was a a yogi, that the Buddhist concept of sunyata or emptiness, he like takes it and he deforms it. He turns it into something that makes life meaningless, whereas it's you're supposed to be just kind of like floating through life, whereas this this emptiness in him morphs and translates into paranoia. Yeah, we did float through the dark a little bit in this movie, particularly in that really long fight scene, which has been praised for its realism. And I didn't feel that it was fake or staged or necessarily choreographed. It was a little bit dark. Dude, they throw down. He's like, you picked the wrong house. And I was like, yeah, you did. (laughs) That was a very graphic fight scene. Uh, I did appreciate, though. That while he killed pretty much everyone else, although he gave them time to monologue, he didn't kill the dog. I was happy that he only put the dog to sleep. Okay, so that and the sparing of Claiborne, the client, what's all that about? Are we supposed to like the killer? He's got his rules. His rules for revenge went so far as to find revenge on the people who actively hurt his family or whatever. And that's it. And when Arliss Howard, the client, was like, I don't know, dude, they offered me a thing for like an extra bonus. And I was like, "Okay," and I pressed a button and that sent them after you. Sorry about that. That wasn't really my intention. It's nothing personal. So Warlock gave the client the uh, the opportunity to do what they would have had to 
do in themselves. He botched the job, for God's sake. So frustrating. He was going to die as a result. And why not put it on the head of the client, you know, to get a little bit more money for something that they were going to do anyway? But it wasn't his fault. And when he assessed that he didn't have anything personally to do with it, he let him go because that's not, he's not, a, he's about discipline and his faux philosophy, his faux philosophy. And so the lawyer and his assistant get it because they actively commissioned the kill and the expert and the brute or whatever, they get it because they carried out the orders on his girlfriend. Meant to be him. But Claiborne is spared because it wasn't personal and the dog was spared because the you know, the dog is a dog. Dogs are awesome. <laughs> but he didn't, the point, I guess, with Post the dog and with the client is that he didn't kill unnecessarily. And in fact, it didn't even kill when it was necessary. Didn't even make the kills he was contracted to make. I'm telling you, man, when you have someone dead to rights, not only do you fire, but you immediately rack and then look through the scope again to see if another shot is warranted or necessary. What did Tom Cruise do unfailingly in collateral is two shots, center mass, and you know that you're done. Two shots and one in the head for good measure. He could have shot that dude even after he shot the hooker and botched it. Yeah, he gets a little frazzled. He also spends a lot of time with Tilda Swinton. I'm not sure why he indulges her for so long. Maybe so that she can have some dialogue. Because right. Because we have to make it worth Tilda Swinton's time. For another misdirect to make us think that she might actually live. That they might have some kind of, look, it's nothing personal. This is a Kill Bill kind of situation. I'm a murderer. You're a murderer. We should go on our murdering merry way or whatever. But Kelly Ray was like, there are definitely cameras in that restaurant. And for all of his being careful and casual German tourist, he was very visible to a restaurant full of people who knew his victim intimately, who knew her name, who knew her order, her regular, like bring me the usual or whatever. They all saw him with no mask. Yeah, he's counting on a lot of facial blindness, especially with Claiborne. I mean, Claiborne could certainly identify him. Is are his threats of "I'm going to make it painful for you"? What did he say? "I'm going to like slowly poison you" or something? I don't remember. Does he, is it he, is he counting on that enough that Claiborne's not going to go after him? Doesn't a person who's who's already funding assassinations doesn't he probably want to get rid of the killer? Yeah, he's not like innocent hoodie man. He went out of his way to have someone else killed. I guess he would go after him. <laughs> right? And yet the killer spares him, probably because he does in the graphic novels, so there can be additional graphic novels. I went into this expecting something much bigger and much shootier. Uh, I thought would be a little bit like the Gray Man, where there's just he's shooting and running and jumping and there's breaking glass and explosions all over the place. It was kind of the opposite. Uh, did you notice that when the killer is like peeping on people, he's like using the telescope just to check out what's happening? Yeah. That he only looks at their foreheads, their hearts, or their groins? I did notice the groin shot, and that's the only one I noticed. But I didn't know who his target was necessarily if that person was down on the street. But uh, yeah, that's interesting to note as perspective marks, potential marks or whatever. He's just, he's practicing. Yeah, he's just peeping. And, but even in his voyeurism and his like crowd watching, he's always looking at like the kill shot zones. But he was no George McFly. He wasn't peeping for the peepedness of it. Like he saw the, the couple having sex or whatever and didn't even linger. That's true. Yeah, he had, he was very impassive. He had no interest in that whatsoever. I think he found the, the old man closing his window to be more interesting. I frankly thought that he was, that I was, I was surprised that he had someone in his life, that he didn't go back to his Leon like solitary life and sit in a chair and drink milk. Although he did that, he put the knife on the nightstand and then like presumably went to sleep in the chair in an elevated position, I guess, so he could jump up and defend himself. But I was like, that dude is a domestic. That's weird. Like who would put up with that dude? <laughs> And for such a high-tech dude, he resorts to the old cup above the cover alarm. Yeah, but that was just balanced, man. That Anything could happen. Those hotels, a slight tremor or something, and you're out of bed and all freaked out and alerting the entire hotel to a crashing sound in the middle of the night. Right. You know, those doors are like tuned to slam shut so that they lock behind you when you leave your, your room. Man. There are higher tech ways that Michael Fassbender just didn't know about. He can't just go back to like his Nubian goddesses on the wall and watch TV. Like he has to have something to live for. Espresso with lemon. But there there just wasn't enough there to hold on to. All I got from his girlfriend was that somehow she understood him and his way of life. And she knew that her her duty to him as a partner was not to give him up, not to say anything. See, they must have like apprehended her at some point because she didn't say anything. 
right? She didn't break. And he was all proud of her and touched. No, I get it. I, I felt for the girlfriend who was going to have a real, a serious scar. But if not for that fact, if not for the little things where she's like, you would have been proud of me. I didn't give you up. I didn't say anything because that's really her sole role in his life or in the movie. Otherwise, she's a liability. And we can't hurt, have her be a liability because she is our only key and insight to him as a person, except for his bullshit monologuing. We He's not really terribly well formed unless you draw heavy information which David Fincher was kind of really banking on, this idea of the Smiths and how they inform his character, which was really expensive, I'm sure, and but also didn't really give us, I don't think, what I needed to really latch on to this character and to be like, he's a person to whom I should listen. All right, some IMDb featured reviews. Eight stars, portrait of a psychopath. I wouldn't say it's a portrait. It's a bare bones napkin sketch. Of a psychopath? I wouldn't agree with that at all, nor with his eight-star rating. Five stars. Great looking, but dull as dishwater. There you go. That's closer and better, and a better assessment. I'm not even sure 100% great looking. Again, very purposefully shot, and maybe dynamic in its contrast and, and lighting, and that's really about it. We went from seven-level green and, and sludgy to, you know, bright Paris digital kind of thing. Seven stars, slick, smart, and slim. I think that is the blurb that I assume that David Fincher is hoping for. It's generic video DVD box critique. And last one, six stars. Was this written by you, Wes? <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Emphasis so, mine. <laughs> look, we talked about uh, other movies like Roma and Mank being like, are streaming services like, is this, they have to find a niche where they can make long, drawn out passion pieces? And David Fincher's been after this project for 20 years. But that was when streaming services were really more in their infancy. Not so much now. They're heavy contenders, as we saw with movies like The Old Garden, Gray Man, and the whole litany of uh, and extraction and all these big budget action pieces. And this movie moved a lot on screen and nothing really happened. I agree. And being true to myself, I have to acknowledge that this movie frustrated me more than I enjoyed it, and thus it has to have a whatever rating. There were too many problems for what should have been a much more entertaining film. Yeah, I was thinking of going with a good light for this Fincher light, <laughs> The Killer, but I think that after this discussion, I'm I'm going to go for what I should have gone for with the other killer movie from this year. Killers of the Flower Moon. I'm going with a boring for the killer, and that's our discussion on the Netflix original from 2023, 818-835-0473, or whatever movies.com or wherever you get podcasts. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time. Hi, I'm Lessa Cadet, host of her Extraordinary Life by Design podcast, where we celebrate women who are shaping their lives one extraordinary day at a time. I speak with women from all over the world about what they do and how they are passionately pursuing their dreams and creating meaningful impacts on their communities. So come join us and learn about all there is to learn about these extraordinary women. Today is working for me. Do you believe that for yourself? Hey, I'm Pastor Julie, and I want to empower you through encouragement, inviting you to my podcast, Big Truth Encouragement, where I unpack living a faith-filled life. I created my podcast for the ladies, but gentlemen, you'll gain something too. So I invite you to listen to Big Truth Encouragement on Electricast and any platform where you listen to your podcast. Electricast.